musical term that I keep coming back to that I think many of you may not be familiar with. So I want to talk about that. That's pre-compositional process. I'll be you know, I'll often referring to that. Every time you hear that, if you're not a composer, just think making up software, making your own programs, because that's all it is, is pretty, uh, when I mention that. And when I talk about perfect systems, I'm talking about perfect systems to generate <clears throat> a kind of perfectly ordered note world of music. And I'm speaking against that. And so, and then the other thing is, <clears throat> a lot of this may be uh, difficult. And so I'm going to be reading slowly. Uh, I'm a teacher. There is no stupid questions for me. And you can ask question over and over again until you're satisfied, and I will not be in the least bit put out. I'm here to serve you. So let me serve you when I finish by asking any question, challenging anything I said, and I'll just do my best and be most honest as I can uh, in <clears throat> answering you. Um, so it may be helpful to write down things like, gee, what's that? <laughs> I don't know what that's all about. And we'll come back to it, and I'll try to explain what I was thinking about at the time. Uh, so, the first... <coughs> greets us all in a particular way. I see us as the last of the 20th century. We're on the end of an edge. And we all have a special role to play because we're the connectors. We're the ones who will be asked, what was it like in the olden times, the 20th century? A sandy beach eroding into the sea, our time drains like a story loose without a teller. Our time is not yet up, but it is surely over. We sit on the end of the edge, looking into an ocean of blank faces. We are the arrows of the 20th century, shot across the great dividing between now and here and then and there. We are the connectors, the tailors of time, the seam makers that bring in the new seam so the fabric of time will not tear. We are the bright patches of yellow shadows that is the fading of a summer day into night. We are the rest. We are the rest to come. We are the rest of the end of the edge. We are the rooms of the rest. We are the rest of the story. We are the savers of the best for last to last. We are here now in the midst of the past. Let us begin. We the leftovers. Reading an obituary, <clears throat> I found these, my words. Hit them from where you are. There is nothing to be gained by wishing you were someplace else or waiting for a better situation. You see where you are and you do what you can with that. Politics of creating a thing only by what is said about it. If things are what you say about them, then the things are in a real danger of becoming totally overwhelmed by what you say about them. The saying about them becomes the thing. This overemphasis on context is structurally identical with the worst elements of our commercial culture. 
every things become things by once removed validation a la proper context. If what is said is the thing, not the thing, then why have the thing in the first place? Let's just have what you say. I mean, what do you say? I like the statement, if you are not conscious and sensitive, things can become merely what you say about them. This statement assumes meanings exist that speech language cannot convey, while making us conscious of the power and importance of the contextual environment that surrounds the things. <clears throat> things are what you say about them too easily becomes it is if you say it is. You saying it is is all that is necessary to validate the itness of it. And if all it takes is for you to say it is, for it to be so, then all conflict in such a world must be resolved by violence. But when a truth exists only by assertion, then competing truths can exist only by the same means more forcefully put. Force, then, becomes the mechanism to ascertain validity. An alternative is to have checks and balances between the context and text. The things, text, has an existence separate from its clothes, context. The things' clothes tell us a great deal, but certainly not all. We are not just what we wear. The thing is given clothes by various people at different times, but the thing also has an essence beyond the clothes. This essence is the thing perceived directly without the buffer of language. We can and should say a great deal about the pitch A440. We can talk about its tone color, its placement in a phrase, but besides all that and more, it can also reach us unfiltered by our language. And we judge things in this relatively unfiltered state very differently than in the language mode. It is in this mode where we find the emperor's clothes are hype without substance. Coke is not it. Coke is not what is said about it. Coke businessmen want us to believe what is said about it. But I taste sweet chemicals of rotting bones causing canes and dentures. Coke is not the real thing. Taste is refined by language. Language is refined by taste. A child loves sweets. Language teaches sweets complexities and dangers. Here, taste is refined by language. This refined, educated taste discovers what is said about it is not so. Here, language is refined by taste. This circle spirals up and balances out. <coughs> Society should cultivate this circle rather than constantly consuming media words. We need to encourage a balance between what is said and the things themselves. A balance between language and taste, or drown in a sea of hype, press packets, and manipulation. What is it that we see? Our structure. We look out to see in. Any phenomenon structures itself through us, or in order for a thing to be a thing and not just anything, it needs something to recognize it as that thing and no other. We cannot perceive chaos. In the act of perception, we order in and through our senses. Chaos can exist only when there is no perception. We extract order out of chaos. We are the universe's filter 
creation's helper. <clears throat> if we are never without order, why do composers concern themselves so much with whether their compositions exhibit order? Often, chaos is just a term to describe an ordering we do not like or accept or refuse to recognize. There are various degrees of perception existing on a continuum from simple ability to hear to apprehending extremely complex designs. Just hearing a pitch is perceiving order. Given my definition of chaos, the composer should seek chaos as an unattainable goal. Now that's real new romanticism for you. Fearing chaos is fearing composition, the releasing of new patterns. Often, the pre-compositional process entails the search for a perfect system, a system that will unify all the sounds in a piece and generate automatic connectivity, a perfect order. It may be a perfect order, but will it be a perfect piece? What do the sounds want? Too often composers are note bullies, note dictators, telling notes what to do without listening to the notes to see what they want to do. It seems we fear that our intuition <clears throat> is a messy jumble, or worse, just a conditioned collection of cliches. Well, it isn't either. Our intuition is a very rapid, rooted, nonverbal pattern pool which has to be listened to rather than force-fed. In this pool can be found personal riches and unique patterns. And those unique patterns exist because each of our sensory apparatus is a little different. We each have different filters. Beneath <coughs> it all, we have differences. Composers fish for those differences. That is composition. Any system provides its own answers. Perfect systems allow no transcendence. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, is a perfectly designed system for an ever-escalating spiral of violence. In a perfect system, everything fits. Since everything fits, one is bound, locked in. Nothing can move, but the system protects itself with its own perfection. Without transcendence, all things are circles with no way up. Perfect systems allow no transcendence, and that is why they are perfectly awful. A perfect system usually generates art, <coughs> work, <coughs> that is mechanically easily explained. Each note is there for a reason. I'd rather each note is there for a sound. For music is not reason. Note machines, note generating systems give uni-dimensional things, things that resist multiple interpretation. I prefer music that resists one perfect ordering. I want the structure of music to be just as alive as life. Music need have nothing to do with logical truth or sequencing. In, La in Lady Chatterley's Lover, D.H. Lawrence says, logic might be unanswerable because it was so absolutely wrong. The overemphasis and importance given to pre-compositional systems can give the illusion of objectivity. It is as if the music exists as a manifestation of a more universal truth rather than as an expression of mere personal taste. No note is chosen for an arbitrary reason. Rather, each note is a correct answer to the question of its origin. It comes from the system, the law. In other words, each note has a distinct point of origin in the overall plan, like fate, is predestined. Each note has a pedigree. Each note is certified by the system. No wild oats or wild notes. The personal responsibility of the composer is hidden behind 
a note government, usually designed in the image of whatever current scientific model for reality that exists, or perhaps worse yet, designed by Old Testament numerology. Even transcendence can be tragic when it gives birth <coughs> to a new perfect system. So-called cultural evolution is often trading one straitjacket for another. We need evolving and involving systems that are seeds for unknown fruit. Perhaps what we need is not systems at all, but schemes, general formats that encourage unforeseen events to occur which will recontextualize the past while pointing to a future that will be otherwise unforeseeable. If we know the results of our compositional process, why use it? What is gained if you know the outcome of the process? What is learned by creating a system that gives predictable answers to predictable questions? Can we make music that behaves like creativity itself? Most Western art music acts as a residue of creativity rather than part of the process itself. The artwork is the final step in a moving, alive process. But the final step is all that is allowed to exist. The process disappears, the best part. I like things that move better than things that stand still. Mobiles are in a state of perpetual process. Things in the state of becoming are more becoming than things that have already come and gone. <coughs> they spoke, but their words froze in the air. They spoke until they had no more words left in them to speak. Then, emptied, they took up the words, all frozen, and struck them with sticks. And each word rang out clear and points north. There are moments in silence that are more silent than the rest. They are dense, focused, little holes of silence, where the ear rings with its own resonance. When I play my snare drum, my touch makes it vibrate. <clears throat> my touch is always different, uneven, full of varying nuance. My touch interacts with the material world and is mirrored in a very tangible sound, which is of me, by me, of me. I am that touch traced in sound. The snare drum is quite finite in its sonic potentials. Because of this, a listener can quickly learn its timbre range. Once the listener is acclimated to the sound of an instrument, the focus of the listening experience is in the actual playing, touching, and the music, which is far more than the mere sound of an instrument. In general, the construction of instruments like keyboard computer synthesizers that offer a seeming infinity, that offer a seeming infinity of sound possibilities seems to miss this point. The design of such keyboard computer instruments values sound over performance. The very availability of infinite instrumental sound potentials invariably diverts the attention of a listener from performance and music to sound. The finite design of the sound world of acoustical instruments is required to encourage our attention to focus on the human touch as prominent over sound as prominent. It is also a curious phenomenon that unusual sounds become very ununusual quickly. For me, music performance is about touching in sound. For me, music composition is the placement of sounds in time, the touch in time. 
Finite systems favor infinite nuance. Finite systems favor infinite nuance. Infinite systems favor finite nuance. Infinite systems favor finite nuance. Devices like the long playing record and radio have given the illusion that music is just sound because each has made us blind to the sound producer. We cannot see the touching. <coughs> so we forget the source of the sound, the human touch, exciting the material world to vibrate in a sensuous synchronicity. Records present disembodied music, making our ear blind. Most design configurations of touch-sensitive real-time computer musical instruments can be programmed so that any touch can produce any sound. Such systems devalue the human touch. If any touch can generate any result, then all touches are basically interchangeable. In such systems, the touch is ultimately used to just merely activate the instrument, not play it. In mainstream Western culture, we have a belief that tool development is progress, and furthermore, that the gradual use and acceptance of advances in tool making are inevitable. The decision of the Amish to shun most 20th century tools is one of the most socially sophisticated positions in recent history. They realize that all tools are value laden, and also, that the values embedded in the new tools would inevitably destroy their belief system and way of life. So they censored the use of those tools in their communities. The Amish realized that the only inevitable thing about the acceptance of new tools is that with the tools, one automatically must accept the morality, values, and systems of human relationships the tools represent and bring about. I remember visiting with an Amishman a few years ago. I asked, why no electricity and motors? He said, those tools save time and create unemployment. And idle hands do the devil's work. And save time for what? Farming is doing God's work. We love God's work. Why would we want to have less time for it? Whether one is religious or not, the Amishman's analysis of the aforementioned technology in the context of his religious beliefs is absolutely correct. In my work as a composer, I refuse to use instruments that devalue the human touch. I compose for only those instruments that reflect the values I hold as central in my music, touching sound and touching with sound. In macrobiotic cooking, the type of energy used to cook the food is the first issue discussed. Wood is best, then gas, electricity is not as good. The microwave oven is totally unacceptable. One can taste the difference in the food depending upon what type of energy cooked it. As well, the energy source for a sound is a real issue for me. When I play my drums, I am the energy source. One hears my energy when I play. For me, music is a touching trade in sound. For me, musical tools are touching tools. For me, Progress is not a collective line to follow like a path with a perfect destination, but like a personal well that gets deeper and sweeter from use. For me, music is for setting the world on fire with the precision of the touch. The woman walks in the ground, planted, balanced, with a face like a deer caught in the headlights <coughs> late at night. The man walks teetering on his knees 
with his eyes hunted and hunting. When they meet, he trips headlong into paradise. She takes on a burden, and that's how the world turns. Sun almost down, deep in the winter woods, thirsty and tired, the boy stopped to see icicles hanging from a branch. He tasted them. The icicles were sweet with maple sap. He went home, no longer hungry for dinner. Seeing him not eating, mother asked, what have you been eating before dinner? The boy said nothing, just the woods. farmer is hauling his wheat seed to be cleaned. <clears throat> he is stopped on the road by a friend. What are you doing? His friend asks. The farmer explained, I'm going to get my wheat seed cleaned. This process sorts out the grass seed, dirt, and thistles, leaving just the wheat seed. To this explanation, his friend replies, aren't you being judgmental? John Cage has often described the purpose of music as self-alteration. And music for self-alteration cannot be of the self. If the self is to be altered, then the music must come from outside the self. Music for the self, not music of the self. The achievements of such a strategy are many. New aesthetic models, new notations, new forms, new processes, etc. But there's a coolness, a detachment, a basic distrust of the self, a self-denial. If it was an achievement, if it was an achievement of the head over the heart, it was thought that you could not have both. The heart was a conditioned robot just beating to the drum of social convention. <coughs> Page's position with his chance procedures is that man is a conditioned creature in great need of constant paradigm shake-up in order to counterbalance an, in, an, innate, an innate need for, so, for security and social intractability. <coughs> in the 70s through 80s, it seems many composers are trying to reform Cage's position by balancing emotional resonance with restrained invention. This is basically a social realist solution, old wine in new bottles. It is not so much a balance that we need as an integration of the intellect of the heart with the heart of the intellect. In circumventing conditioning to create new musical paradigm, what becomes of judgment? How should we judge? How do we sift through the compositional process? So we have circumvented our musical parents. Now what? And lastly, and perhaps more importantly, by making music that advertises itself as being made without judgment, do we not encourage social irresponsibility? The little boy was fed little sparks with his morning cereal. As he grew older, the sparks began to ignite into a bigger and bigger fire until in middle age he burned out. That's the end of my talk. Have. I don't want to hear myself speak. I get 
I'll get, I'll get more nervous than I did before. <laughs> I, I was wondering about one thing. Sure. I hope I can remember it. So in, in the beginning, you were talking about separating the the thing from talking about it, you devalue it and all that. And it, it implies that like there's an absolute reality. To me it seemed like and like it's that one thing you can talk about all different ways. You put on different clothes, but it's still that one absolute reality. But later on it was um, our nothing is except with perceptions. Right? So you, you're talking about perceptions of the thing. And I, I was trying to put this together in the same model yeah. of reality. Well the first uh, little paper, the politics one, was dealing with uh, a statement that Herbert Bruhn loves to make, <coughs> which is, you know, things are what you say about them. Well, okay, I mean, if he wants to accept Madison Avenue, he can't, because that's exactly what Madison Avenue hopes you'll all believe, too. And I always thought Herbert was totally uh, contradictory there. Uh, of course, things are not merely what you say about them. Uh, there's a lot more to life than our, our verbal language. We all have body language. There's the life of the spirit. Uh, I can go on and on and on. And to just mere, merely reduce reality to, to language, to me, seems to be a uh, <coughs> very dangerous thing, as a matter of fact, because language <coughs> can be used to manipulate. And sometimes, you know, we, we that whole story about the emperor without any clothes was one about context. You know, the, the whole story is about context. And it took a kid who wasn't really schooled in the context to say, hey, gee, the emperor doesn't have any clothes on. I mean, the reason a kid did that and not an adult is because the, the adult was already, you know, uh, conditioned to accept certain contexts. So I think we have to be careful of just accepting contextual information. We have to continually test the thing and the context to see if they match up. If they don't, then we have hypocrites. Or, people that, we, or, or we have to be cautious or whatever. Does that mean there's like one reality? I doubt that it is. No, it doesn't. I, well, the, the, the statement about chaos was basically this. So many times my, I, my music's played and, and I was, someone will say, gee, that just sounds like a lot of chaos. And I just, that was my response to that. I mean, you can't perceive chaos. Chaos is, human beings can't perceive chaos. And the minute you perceive anything, you, you have structured it so it can be perceived. So, I mean, then the next step is, did I, if you can't perceive chaos and that thing isn't chaos, then the, then the question should be, well, what are the designs in that music I didn't catch? And maybe I should listen to it some more so that I can catch it. So that was a response to that problem composers, not just myself, have with the, you know, the whole chaos name problem. I would uh, disagree with you in the business of not being able to perceive chaos. I would, in fact, go to the extreme of saying it is all that we perceive is chaos. Um, and uh, what you see as being static is simply a form of static at that end of, the continu of, of chaos. Uh, low chaos. When we see this tree out here, we don't see the tree. We we perceive um, texture. Uh, texture is a form of chaos. In fact, that's how we talk about chaos. Mm -hmm. This texture versus that texture. And we talk about textures as being dense or being or uh, or being open. Uh, we perceive color, different types of color, uh, in, in those terms. How do you respond to that? I think we're saying the same thing. Yes. I mean, it's just a different way of saying exactly the same thing. I mean, because what you're talking about, it seems to me, is, yeah, we have this potential, you know, all, all I'll end up doing is paraphrasing what you just said. I agree with what you said, because I don't see it as all it's what I said. I see human structure, what we see, what is it <coughs> that we see, our structure? We look out and see in. I mean, that's what scientists have been telling us. 20th century scientists, they don't say, look, we're, 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 this is reality. They're saying, no, this is what we can, this is what we can perceive as reality. That's a whole different statement. This is what it's possible for us right now to perceive as reality. Not this is reality, but this is what our sensory apparatus can apprehend as the nature of the universe. You can't leave the observer out of the 
the, the equation of what's being observed. That's 20th century science. And the minute you have that, that's a whole different ball of wax. There's no absolutes then. It's just a continuing kind of, what is it out there? Well, I don't know. Let's see if we can get a new machine to figure out what it, you know. As I understood Herbert Bloom when he spoke, I don't think he meant to speak of language as an absolute by saying that things are what you say because, well, just by accident he had said something about, you said, he talked about in the beginning, we talked about language as violence and he mentioned just in passing language or violence and as I understood it um, when he said things are what you say about them I didn't hear him say that but when you get down to the physical logic of his language and his use of it I don't think that what he meant was what he exactly said. Herbert would say he only means what he exactly said. <laughs> well, let me clear up one point. <clears throat> I didn't say the language was violence. I said this. If you come, if, if things get to, it is if you say it is. Right? Things are what you say about them. Too easily becomes it is if you say it is. If it becomes that, then the only way to resolve conflict is through force. That's not saying that language is violence. But if, if, if it's just my assertion that what I'm saying is true, and it's just my assertion, then the only way we're going to be able to uh, uh, resolve any kind of conflict is, is through force. But you're not a circular thing. You're not a finite system. <clears throat> I'd like to contest that too because I just thought that um, music, of, I'm not sure if that John Cage's quote right, but it seemed that music of the self by definition of itself, not the word, just music of itself is by definition not um, is is self-altering because a person is not a fixed system. And I think a mobile is a fixed system and the wind that acts on it is the non-fixed variable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because you had said that mobiles are not perpetual process. No, I said they were. Uh, yeah, that, oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading it wrong. I'm reading what I wrote wrong. You said mobiles are perpetual process when I, I thought that mobiles are not process but are a finite system because they're made a certain way even if they move a certain way. The variables that act upon them are what change them and thus make that relationship a process and not just a system. That was pretty elegant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah, that's fine. I have no response to it. I think it was an elegant way of saying that. It reminds me of that old Zen story where you have three Zen monks and they're walking around and they see this flag. And one of them says, oh, look at the flag in the wind. And, said, no. and the other guy says, no, 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 no. That's the wind acting on the flag. And then the other one says, no, 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 no. that's the mind moving. They're all three right. <laughs> I'd like to uh, have you uh, elaborate more on the concept of hit him from where you are. And it seems to me that, um, uh, and, and perhaps, let, let me, uh, you know, uh, That was an obituary of a prize fighter, by the way. Well, <laughs> yeah, but. Uh, well, <coughs> I think perhaps you know me well enough to know that that's something I believe very strongly. And yep. I believe that if you're in jail, um, if you need to make art and you have two spoons, that that is your technology. Yep. And uh, that you have really no excuse not to make art and art that is relevant in the society that you live. Yep. But suppose that um, you, are, you are in a situation where your tools are 
by chance the most current technologies. What is your obligation? My obligation is to try to make them as rough as possible. Uh, I think the problem with a lot of current technology, as it is today, that may be solved at some point, and I think if anyone's going to solve it, we've got the gentleman right here to do it. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. I've been around. I've been around the country at a lot of facilities. This is the most sophisticated uh, and best use of finances I've ever seen, and it, for a whole bunch of systematic reasons. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, but, but my problem with a lot of technology is that because it's so know, perfect, when it, everything's so smooth, um, that I find it just boring, tactically boring, sensuously boring. And I would try then to make it as rough as possible. I mean, we, we, we've grown up in a world of roughness and an un, 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 unevenness. I mean, we, we, you know, everything we're looking at is, is, is rough surfaces, uneven surfaces, and <clears throat> basically a lot of our technology produces very smooth things. <coughs> so I think the first thing I would attack would be the problem of could I get enough complexity in the system? Uh, I guess probably that would be a pro problem of memory. But enough complexity in the system, one, so that I would produce rough objects, and then two, could I get into the system I continually subvert the system with my own personal taste. And I know it's something that's dear to your mind with your Raku program. And uh, I think those are the, some of the things that I would you know, really consider. And then I think another thing I would consider is where is the human being in performance with a system? Uh, it's so uninteresting for me, and this is a cliche, to have a speaker and you listen to the speaker. I, I really don't listen to records very much. I'm not a fan of radio unless it's talk radio. I really like live music with musicians up there doing their thing because I see music as not just sound. I mean, when a performer walks to the piano like this, <laughs> right, you already have a performance. So if the performer walks to the piano, like this, right? I mean, it's, it's all it's theatrical. It's a whole number. And I want to see that. When the performer, you know, plays B flat, even probably plays it the same each way, but the performer goes. <laughs> That's beautiful. Or, or if, it's, or if, it's, if it's Count Basie, you know, you go. <laughs> same B flat, same sound, but uh, the whole corporeal, the whole body, the dance. That's music, not just someone, just some disembodied sounds coming over a loudspeaker. So I would have to address that issue. I would probably make the, the system very finite, as I said before, so that the performer is the central issue expressing and touching through the sound. If I give the performer every sound that's possible to play, well then he, he or she almost doesn't matter. It's just every sound that's possible to play becomes the issue. The thing about an acoustical instrument that's so beautiful is its sheer simplicity. I mean, you and I were at a concert in New York where they played one of your lovely pieces. And all what I did is I asked a number of composers to write for an unaccompanied snare drum. And we had 17 unaccompanied snare drum pieces. I mean, talk about reduced technology. I mean, bare bones. But yet the audience was enthused. You have these people coming up. Each snare drum would look different and they had their different instruments and you know, and uh, each piece was a little different and that was performance. And uh, you know, a snare drum is pretty you know, rat-a-tat-tat. -tat. You know, that's it. It's all there is to it. But yet it was a compelling performance, a compelling concert and I will put that snare drum up against a synclavier. I will compete with a synclavier anytime anyone wants to do a battle of the bands. And I'll tell you, the snare drum, the $70 snare drum will come out pretty good to a $100,000 synclavier because basically we respond to the, the look. I can look you right in the eye. I can look you right in the eye. And I can play to you. And that's performance. Performance is human to human. Now, when a machine 
gets in the way of that, then I don't want that machine. When the machine can enhance that, I'll take a new technology. I'm not against anything new just because it's new, but I have values, and I'm going to make judgments on my values. <coughs> and if the machine seems to get in the way, well, let's wait until it, you know, it's maybe developed in a way that it won't. You know, I'm very interested in the act of performance and communicating with the audience as deeply as I can. So I've stayed away from those machines. I just, I remember improvising with Sal uh, Matarano, who I think is a very sophisticated musician who has made computers, one of the first people to make computers that you could play. And <clears throat> I'd be playing along percussion, and I'd just sort of get tired, and this machine would just keep going on and on, and it had no breath, and it had no, I mean, it just could go forever, and had, you know, and I'd be going like this, and the machine's going, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, I was just being worn out by this thing. It was, uh, yeah, it was. There was no way to kiss it, shake its hand, or give it a hug. They put little arms on it. Smiling face. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you made the comment that I am that touch traced in sound. Yeah. You know, if we each got on, say, a, a computer system that helped generate music, you know, no one is going to be able to recreate exactly the same composition. No, we're all different. And, and then we each have an input. Yeah, and the differences are going to come out despite the technology, I would agree. But as a performer, and I, w I was talking in a more narrow sense than I think you took Just it. performance. Yeah, but what, you, what you're saying is absolutely true. I mean, any one of us taking those technologies going to do them in, in different ways. So it's not as cut and dried as my paper uh, said. And, 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 I don't, and I don't feel as cut and dried as my writings often tend to be very didactic. And I, I know there's gray areas. And, uh, and there's a lot of actually wonderful music I've heard using new technologies uh, that have come out. Uh, but this is where I'm, that's why I kept saying for me, for me. I, I didn't want to like preach to people. I mean, God knows, I think eventually these things are going to be sorted out and, that, and some beautiful things will come from it. But this is where I stand right now. It doesn't mean that in 10 years uh, things will have you know, not changed. Plus, the way I compose <coughs> is very old fashioned. Um, I don't have a, a whole set of pre compositional rules that I follow. I just basically I sit down at the piano or vibraphone or whatever instrument I'm thinking at at the time, listen to the sounds, write them down, come back the next day, erase a little bit, listen some more, erase a little bit, until I can't erase anymore, and then the piece emerges. It's a really very intuitive uh, process that usually takes me in a year to make a 12 minute piece. I, and I work every day at it. Um, so I think another, perhaps, reason I've never used th these technologies is because if I was interested in pre-compositional systems, the, the, the computer would be very useful in being able to help me work those things out. And since I compose pretty, well, really, I mean, really old-fashioned way of composing, uh, it, it just would get in my way. And, and, and let's 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 face it, though everybody, you really have to face it. Would a word processor have made Shakespeare or Cervantes a better writer? I don't know. It'd be interesting, though, to find out logistically how many laborers he had running around for him. Perhaps he <coughs> had a word processor. Good point. Good point. I wanted to just uh, raise a question. Um, there is a, uh, we've discovered through technology that there are a lot of invalidic minds. There are, I mean, I shouldn't say minds, but bodies, with minds that have uh, great capabilities. Yes. And through technology, um, we've been able, 
they have been able to been able to uh, to write, mm -hmm. uh, to do uh, mathematical calculations, to do work which is right on the cutting edge and help yep. society outside of them. Yep. Um, I personally believe that I couldn't exist um, at any other time before now as a composer. I feel as though I'm an invalid to a certain extent. If it wasn't for technology, for me, uh, in other words, when I'm writing a string quartet, mm -hmm. to be able to hear the string quartet as I work it, uh, uh, as I write it, not to hear it as good as it sounds when it's performed by live performers, but to hear it, to have feedback. Technology has given me this fast turnaround of time. Uh, the world is unsympathetic to performance of my music. The computer is stupid. It's a slave to me. It performs my music. And I'm able to get the feedback that I need to grow. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have never seen uh, technology as an end in itself, though I do sometimes produce um, pieces which are electronic all by themselves, not to be played by yeah. uh, human beings. Yeah. Um, my primary use of technology has been uh, towards a human interactive um, final product. Mm -hmm. And uh, how, what's your reaction to that? I've never had any argument with your work. <laughs> <laughs> that I found your work among the most sophisticated uh, human interactive ways of using technology I know. Um, you know the limits and the capabilities of technology. I just have no argument. What an argument. <laughs> no, I think you... Let me find think, another area. <laughs> no, I have no argument with it. You don't treat it as a fetish. You see it as a tool. Don't you see technology as uh, coming to a, I a halt, or to a slow, like slowing the pace, slowing the pace down to where uh, there isn't so much diversity? Because it seems like there's a constant turnaround, like something that comes out to the head of the market, I guess now will be yep. considered obsolete yep. or old, mm -hmm. you know, old mm -hmm. tools. And uh, it seems like it's happening so rapidly and so quickly that there's got to be some time where it's kind of slow, where man can sit back and take a look at what his choice is and then make decisions, which would be more on what you're talking yep. about, being able to yep. say, well, I don't have the latest technology, but this is what I want to use because of my values, because right. this is the sound that I want to portray. Yep. This is, um, I'm glad that you spoke to that Me too. so well, too. Yeah. And this is precisely the reason uh, why I feel it's necessary to bring in people like Stuart here to talk to us, because we need someone to put on the brakes and to focus our priorities on what counts. The technology is very important, but it, it, it's not really that important at all. Um, it's, it, there's a kind of vacuous emptiness that comes with it. Um, that goes back to that thing, you know, which I'll probably take it out of context. He says, um, the musician should make chaos an unattainable goal, which is similar to using a computer nowadays because there's so much the constant trying to logic it this way, this way, this way, this way, and you're never reaching what the sound that you want because you're, you're concentrating on, I have so many different directions I could go in, and you're not really concentrating on the sound that you want. Because it's more based on I'll experiment instead of actually coming to a conclusion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I found... Well, let me say a few things. I mean, I would be... <coughs> I would be dead twice if it wasn't for technology. Medical technology. So, I mean, I... You know... And most of <coughs> families and Mennonite families, old, old order Mennonites, they'll use every modern technology and medicine you can shake a six stick at to keep their family in good shape. Uh, just a matter of, I, I really do think, and I don't have an answer for everybody, I really do think people have to sit back and say, who am I, what are my central values, what tools out there will help me to exist in the world with my values intact and, and also growing, and then go with that. I think, that, I think that what I see at many schools is this kind of blind, you know, oh, we've got to have the latest this and the latest that. Well, you know, really, education, all it needs is sensitive teachers, sensitive and inquiring students, a blackboard, some chalk, and um, conversation. But that's the basis of it. The rest of it's frills. 
the basis of it is what we're doing right here, sharing ideas. It's not like I'm right, you're wrong, or whatever. <coughs> it's basically trying to together find our way in the world. If we have all these other tools, wonderful. If they can help you, wonderful. But I think it, what you're saying is very important. I think we all already should start putting on the brakes and find out where we want to go with things. What have we, what have we lost? What have we gained? Have we, have we gained more than we've lost? If not, we don't have to keep continually accepting everything that comes down the pike because, oh, it's new. Well, is it, is it good for me? There's a question. I mean, not all things are new that I found good for me. That's all. Yeah, first of all, I, I, I like, love your, your logic flow in a lot of places. I was wondering if there's one paradox I'm feeling that you could speak to, which is probably more or just a vehicle to describe the compositional pro process for you. And that is, we're talking about computers. As is, <coughs> you don't need anything to be creative. You don't any tools you can make use of. Mm -hmm. To me, that's like the idea of artistic vision. It's kind of you know what this thing you're trying for, regardless of tools. You're trying for a thing. You're going for it. And then, then if a computer works as that as your tool, that's fine. If if, if the spoons work as your tool, that's fine. But I was wondering if that matches the idea of not knowing what you're going to get. Artistic vision versus. The idea of growing and put yourself in a compositional situation where you don't know what's going to happen and all that. Yeah, see, when I, when I go to my work as a composer, I don't know what I'm going to get. Because what I'm trying to do, and I'll speak to this in the next lecture, uh, which really deals with music and how, you know, compositional processes I see it. But what I try to do is... <coughs> I think I should say this now, but yeah. There are really three kinds of thinking that I work on as a composer. And I try to keep them in balance. It's fast thinking, slow thinking, and taste thinking. Fast thinking is sometimes referred to as intuitive thinking. It's nonverbal. It's multidirectional. It has a great deal of energy, but it's not good for long distance. You know, if a car comes at you, you get out of the way quickly, you don't think, my foot needs to go here, and then the next foot needs to go back, right? You just move. That's fast thinking. Slow thinking is what we're doing right now. It's verbal, it's rational, and it's linear, one word after the other. And it's very good for developing ideas, for developing the fast thinking. And oftentimes a computer is a good use of, you can plug in some past fast thinking and then have the computer generate a whole bunch of ways of dealing with that. That may be one way of using it, because uh, it's a slow thinking device. Then taste thinking is to develop the sensuousness of the tactile self. I mean, there is intelligence in our senses. We touch another person, there's an expressiveness, there's an intelligence. And this intelligence, the, this, the taste can be developed. All of these can be developed. So that if you make some pudding in it, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a, you can, the formula is really elegant, right? I mean, the, the, the recipe is the most elegant thing in the world, but then you taste it, and it's like, ugh. Well, throw it out. <laughs> because if it don't taste good, forget it. So you, the composer must deal with all three kinds of thinking and keep them in balance. And I really don't need a lot of tools to work that way, other than the acoustical ones I mentioned. Uh, because a lot of my work is fast and taste thinking, and I'm not much with uh, slow thinking when I'm doing when I'm composing. In other words, when I'm composing. If you were to do, an, if there was ever possible to do a, a word scan, like how many words are in my mind, you wouldn't find any. There's no words in my mind. There's, there's just sounds and gestures, and that's my thought. And it's very fast, and I don't need words to slow it down. Does this ever? I'm just going to ask. I just wanted to know when you're doing a lot of fast thinking mm -hmm. for an extended period of time, does it ever affect? Yes, it makes it more sophisticated. It filters down. You mentioned that did that in your own life. Remember when we were talking? And I was thinking about that. It filters down. Yeah. Um, and the 
reason I read the poems was to give you fast thinking. These poems were all done as fast thinking, and I wanted to give you a little bit of that so that we wouldn't be just caught up in my slow thinking all the time. So I could give you a little heart along with the head. Because we uh, lose a lot of that. Oftentimes, teachers forget that students are humans and vice versa. So the poetry was there to just reveal that. Just a break from the rest of that high pollutant stuff. Fast thinking is good for <coughs> composition. Like for me, I have a very hard time uh, writing. Mm -hmm. I can write things, but it's, it's hard for me. I can speak it better than I can write. You know, it's quicker. Yeah. It's quicker mode mm -hmm. of thought process. I've had the same experience. How do you, I mean, I'll, I'll ask a question, like, I wish you'd teach me something, but how could I use that in a, in a um, more profitable way? Because I would like to be able to write you know, better and speak better okay. or have it better. I grew up with a learning disability. To read out loud for you was a major trauma today. I mean, I didn't learn to read until I was about 11. Uh, but, so I, I uh, and to learn to write was an extraordinarily, it was like Mount Everest for me to write this stuff. How I did it was to keep journals. I just wrote every day little ideas. And before long, just writing every day, I overcame the learning disability. And now I feel comfortable writing, and I think the writing's not too bad. And um, now the hardest part for me is to read out loud. I mean, it's just, it's just hard for me to do that, because my eyes can easily get swimming, and I can get drowned in the words, and I go back and forth. And I have to, like, really concentrate to keep my eye on the line. Uh, but to write every day. And to write what's ever on your mind, and don't call yourself wrong. Just whatever you feel, you know, it's, it's about per personal relationship, or an idea, a philosophical idea. Then sometimes they'll turn into longer bits of writing, like little essays. And that's what the, the, those writings were, where, you know, I, you know, some are little, little ideas, some are longer ideas. And then you begin to get your own personal outlook on things. And you begin to develop as an artist, you know, your own path. <coughs> and, and it will improve your fast thinking. I see, I think that if you improve taste thinking, then your fast thinking gets improved. If you improve slow thinking, you know, all of these different little thinkings, one of the, if one of them improves, it sort of helps the other, because there's probably some synapse in the left and right there that sort of, you know, gets some nice things traveling back and forth. So, um, <coughs> listen to a lot of music, and your taste thinking gets better, or look a lot of theater. I, I love theater myself, I, try to see as much as possible, and the more I see, the more, and it's not that I'm giving lectures, I just see a lot of theater, you just begin to pick up what's good, what isn't so good. Um, reading a great deal helps the slow thinking, and it's just uh, all of these processes. And then meditation, not speaking, I mentioned this to you, if, if you're a really good speaker, if you've got a, you know, a terrific um, command of the English language, and you can really talk yourself to death, and you can analyze something until it comes blue, but you have a hard time finishing anything, then don't speak for days at a time. Just don't talk. And then your fast thinking will begin to get going and get energized and get a little energy and a little breathing room, and then when you do start to talk, everything gets in balance. Because I sometimes... Can and my composition students, if they can really talk well, I tell them to shut up in a nice way. But just don't talk so much. Do something. Just do. It's balancing. And I think education, I don't think we have to talk about composition, but just education in general. You balance these kinds of thinking. Uh, because you, you come out uh, better for it. And, and, and you're more talented, and you can do more, and you have more energy, and all those kinds of good things. So primary focus of your, uh, 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 the primary technique that you use in teaching composition is teaching them fast, slow, and taste thinking, and yeah. how they, the strategies they can use to keep those in balance? Yes. Yeah, that's right. I have a, another question for you. Um, I'd like to take a little issue with what you said about uh, um, Cage, he, um, the idea of him 
seeking growth through uh, music which is not of himself. Yes. It seems to me that uh, Cage's uh, Zen background and his belief in, in, in Zen ideas uh, would disallow that point of view. He would he could would perceive nothing as being apart from himself. He, this is. Uh, uh, oh, I I think you're ultimately right. You see, when I when I argue uh, about Cage, it's not actually what he does, but what he, how he talks about it. And how he's always talked about it is, is that taste is this, you know, mere taste. And um, we have to circumvent it because it's so stupid. And we're going to use chance techniques to circumvent it because really taste is just this thing that's holding everybody back from growing. And I find that just an irresponsible talk. I mean, Cage doesn't do that. Cage throws the dice to alter his taste, to enlarge his taste, to refine his taste. And, and, and he, I know Cage, and I've never been around a person with a m more educated ta taste than Cage. But he, he does the same thing with indeterminacy. I mean, he's not working with pure indeterminacy. He's working in stochastic mathematics. He's working in probability. Yet he talks about it as if it was chance. Well, show me chance in the universe. I don't see it. Well, perhaps he's, he's confronted with uh, failures within the language. Well, I think he just got to be more careful. I think he'd be more careful with his language and how he talks about what he does. I think it, uh, that's the issue I take with John. Um, you yourself are talking about you know, taking black and white uh, positions. Mm -hmm. uh, just for the, uh, the sake of, of taking a position that could be then reacted to, because there's nothing more easy to react to than a black mm -hmm. or white issue. Yeah. Uh, perhaps that has something too. Although I agree with you 100%, I, I don't know Cage personally, but I've been at uh, um, talks that where he's talked, he's presented certain contrasting ideas, and I can't believe that this man uh, hasn't uh, come to terms with grayness. Yeah. And uh, well, the other thing is, you know, everyone, if Cage is an anarchist, and everyone says, "Oh, isn't that lovely? Cage is an anarchist." Well, I'm against anarchism. <laughs> I, I think anarchism, when it's left to its uh, own, becomes just the invitation for totalitarians to take over. Now, I, I'm going to treat John Cage, the nice man that he is, seriously. I don't believe in anarchism. I think only people without children believe in anarchism. I have four children. <laughs> if you're single, anarchism's a wonderfully romantic notion. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have been really a delightfully attentive audience, and I know I presented some things that were probably hard to handle, maybe swallow. Uh, I appreciated your warmth and friend friendly greeting. So, thank you.